The following series is meant as pure fan fiction, and in no way does it share the views of anyone else or those involved in this story. If you have not watched If Kurt Cobain Lived, 1994, 1995, as well as 1996 and 1997, it is essential that you go back and watch those videos before arriving at 1998, as the previous events are crucial to the events we have arrived at in 1998. We will start with a quick recap of 1997. With Rohypnol on the shelves for a few weeks, the fan base is divided and it is known that this will be the final send-off for Nirvana, as they disbanded during the recording process of this album. After hours of convincing, Kurt would reluctantly agree to release the unfinished product the band had produced in the spring and summer of 1996. Further into 1997, the sale of the album would dwindle and fan interest with the band is at an all-time low. After failing to meet his prior obligations to his record label, Cobain and Nirvana as it stands are dropped from the label, forcing Cobain to give up millions of dollars. Although it is known that by late 1997, Cobain and his former management would work out a deal outside of a courtroom, which would see Kurt lose a substantial percentage of his revenue from Nirvana sales and he would ultimately have no rights to his prior released music. Around the same time, Cobain and Stipe officially began working on their conceived project. Mark Lanigan would join in on this, and recording of this project would be based out of Kurt's home outside of L.A. and Seattle, where Lanigan resides. There are widespread rumors of Kurt retiring from music altogether and becoming a full-time producer, although those are just rumors. In the fall of 1997, Cobain establishes his own record label, with Capitol Records as a parent company. At first, he names the new label Abort Christ Records, but with Capitol unwilling to establish a label using that name, Cobain elects to name the new label, Sellout Records. By the end of 1997, Kurt and Courtney have been speaking back and forth on the phone. Around the same time, Cobain finishes his work mixing and mastering this new unnamed group's music, with a potential 1998 release on Cobain's label. This brings us to 1998. January 1998, Cobain, Stipe, and Lanigan begin having their CDs pressed under Kurt's new label, Sellout Records. The group decides to name their project Relevant, as a play on Lanigan and Cobain's previous ventures, as well as life experiences, stating that they are still relevant. The album artwork is an oil painting done by Cobain himself. It's a small house in a vastly open field to represent isolation and being reclusive. Much like how the album itself was conceived and recorded. The album is to be released with haste. Releasing on January 19th, 1998. Just weeks after it was completed. So the members of this group can move on to other projects and obligations they have with their own bands and record labels. Minus Cobain, who is no longer on Geffen Records, but instead holds his own title of ownership with his new label, Sellout. Very little marketing is done for this album. No commercials or ad promos are released. It is, however, teased on MTV News. It is said that this will be Cobain's first solo ventures away from Nirvana. Cobain hasn't released any form of music since 1996's Rohypnol, which was released by Nirvana under the Geffen Records label. Although this album features Cobain, it is nowhere near a Kurt Cobain album. 
Kurt simply had input on the creative process, along with writing select few songs along Michael Stipe back in 1995 and 1996, as well as mixing and mastering the album himself. But it is in no way considered Cobain Originals. He is simply just involved. February 1998 Relevant releases its album under the same name. This album is released to overly warm sales. It's well received by critics, but not often talked about, and it is nowhere near the popularity that Nirvana once had. It is not sought after by casual Nirvana fans, as this album sounds and feels nothing like Nirvana. It is the complete opposite. Mainly acoustic, very slow and somber songs with Kurt lightly tapping drums to those acoustic guitar riffs, with Michael Stipe and Mark Lanigan providing the vocal tracks. Kurt Cobain is barely heard on this album. He provides very subtle, soft background vocals that easily blend into Lanigan's voice to create a new harmony dynamic that fits together very well with the two voices. As well as Michael Stipe's very distinct vocal style and voice. After about two weeks of the album being on shelves, it is generally forgotten about in the mainstream, which at the time seems like something Cobain wanted anyway. This album would prove to be the only Cobain, Stipe, Lanigan effort. The three would never reform this new band, and in the following weeks after release, the group would only play a handful of coffee shop-esque diners and dive bars around Seattle and L.A., with many fans of this album believing it's a Seattle-based project. Not much is known about Cobain's home studio, other than rumors about him becoming a full-time producer. By no means does this feel like a serious project for any of the members. They just wanted to write some songs and have a good time, and to get Cobain's label off the ground, which was successful in that task. After the initial release... Cobain saw this album as an afterthought. He enjoyed being part of other people's music. He liked the idea of collaborations. And he loved the idea that he can create and release music without having to go on massive, full-scale world tours. Being on Kurt's new label, the album's sales will garner revenue. Kurt can now receive royalties from this new music, as well as Stipe and Lanigan. It's a three-way split between the group. Everyone will receive the same percent of any revenue the album generates. Although Kurt is the sole producer on the album, he elected to have a three-way split rather than him gain a slightly larger percent for him running and operating the label, as well as mixing and mastering the album by himself. Cobain, quote-unquote, didn't care about the money, nor did he care for the business side of things. He just wanted to release his own music safe and secured away from any big-time record labels and full-scale world tours. At this time in 1998, Kurt Cobain holds no rights to the previous music he released under the Nirvana name. Those songs are owned by David Geffen and David Geffen Company, Geffen Records. Kurt only receives a mere 5% of anything they make off selling old Nirvana records. A very drastic drop from the percentage he was making before Nirvana was dropped from the label. The relevant album doesn't sell well enough to keep Cobain financially stable. If Cobain wants to continue any form of music career from this point on, he will have to work harder on his own music. Kurt Cobain is contacted by PJ Harvey, who wants to discuss some music ideas and how much she admires Cobain, and his previous works with Nirvana, and his latest efforts with Relevant. Kurt always liked P.J. Harvey, as far back as the Nirvana days, so he very gladly took the call and put together a schedule where the two can get together and potentially work on some new music, or talk about ideas. Around this time, Cobain and Courtney Love have been talking over the phone. It hasn't been anything serious, but it's been civil. They have a child together, and they don't want Frances to grow up thinking her parents hate each other, 
neither Kurt or Courtney ever wanted that for their child. At this point in time, Kurt doesn't care what Courtney's doing or who she's seeing. They aren't married. They got divorced two years ago. Kurt was just sick of her cheating on him all the time and taking control of his life and his band. Once he got off heroin, away from Courtney, and away from the band, Kurt's life started to finally come together. He's in his 30s now. The real shame is that, in our real timeline, Kurt dies in his 20s. He's still very young. A lot of people who went through similar issues that Kurt was dealing with at the time of his death overcame a lot of these issues later in life, after their 20s. Kurt is 31 in this timeline. He's alive. And now, four years after his potential death, he's finally starting to get his life together. Or so it may seem. March, 1998. Kurt begins work on some new material at home. Right now it's nothing solid, but since getting part of his life on track, he feels like it's time to make a proper solo album. With his name. He doesn't want to be on a big time label and sell millions of records. But he doesn't have to. The issue here is that Kurt still retains some memory loss issues and has a hard time coming up with new material. He feels that he has quote unquote hit a brick wall creatively when it comes to new music ideas. In mid-March of 1998, Kurt begins to contact Courtney over the phone more. He arranges a meet to drop off Francis Bean in person. The two will fly to Seattle in early April to meet Courtney. This will be the first time Kurt and Courtney will see each other in person in over three years. Kurt elects that the two should sit and talk. He also states that he wants to go through his old closet for some stuff he left there when he moved. Kurt just wanted his old tapes. This is one of the only reasons he arranged to meet with Courtney at the Lake Washington house that she still resides in to this day. It's known that he's trying to be civil towards Courtney for the sake of his daughter. But he's really hoping all of his old demo tapes from 1994 are still there. There's a lot of material on those tapes he can use. A lot of which we haven't heard in our real timeline. We can only begin to imagine what's on those tapes. By the end of March, Relevant is certified gold. This is as far as it will reach on its lifespan. The album sold in big numbers at first, dying off within the first month, leaving it at the gold status. Hype for this album would die off, but it would garner a cult following through the remainder of 1998. April 1998 Kurt and Francis catch a flight to Seattle. He plans on going to the Lake Washington house in which Courtney still resides, though she is rarely there. Upon arriving at the house, Kurt is greeted by Frances Bean's nanny who takes care of her while she stays with her mother in Seattle. Courtney is not present, even though Kurt and Courtney previously had set this date for them to meet. But this angers Kurt. She knew he was coming, and she didn't make the effort. The nanny tells Kurt that Courtney is away on business and that something had come up during the recording of Hole's new record. Kurt begins to question what could possibly be more important than meeting him and their daughter. This leads Kurt to believe that Courtney still doesn't care and that she's still, quote-unquote, the same old witch she always was. Kurt would later find out that his good friend Patty Schemmel who is the drummer for Hole, is being forced out of her position as drummer in request to the producer working on Hole's new album. Right now, this is beside the point. Courtney didn't meet Kurt like the two had agreed. Now he's at the Lake Washington home in Seattle. 
He hasn't set foot on this property since April of 1994. It is now the beginning of April 1998, four years after what would have been Kurt's death in our real timeline. Visibly angered, Kurt Cobain requests to use the bathroom before departing the house. The nanny would agree to let him use the bathroom. Instead of going to the bathroom, Kurt goes directly into his old room, which has only slightly changed around from the last time he was there, four years ago. All he remembers about it is the closet was filled with his journals and his tapes. He goes directly for the closet to see what's in there. Although there is old tapes and journals, he feels like there was a lot more in the closet before he took off to rehab in 1994. He feels as if Courtney may have took some of the important tapes left behind. But he can't remember what was there to begin with. Cobain begins filling his suitcase with the tapes and journals when the nanny walks in to confront him about rummaging through Courtney's things. She would be noted as saying, quote-unquote, This doesn't look like the bathroom. Kurt replied with a simple, It might as well be and continues filling up his suitcase with his old tapes. The nanny tries to contact Courtney to no avail, and on his way out of the house, he states to the nanny, quote-unquote, We both know these things belong to me. The nanny does not respond. With Courtney not in town, Kurt takes his suitcase filled with tapes over to Mark Lanigan's house. He planned on staying in Seattle for the night regardless, and now he needed somewhere to go. It's not like he was going to stay at the Lake Washington home. That place is filled with bad memories and bad energy. Especially with the greenhouse still sitting there above the garage, untouched for four years. Kurt is willing to bet his old shotgun is still up there, exactly where he left it but he didn't have any intentions on looking. He calls a cab and makes his way over to Mark's house. Upon arriving at Mark's house, Kurt is greeted by Dylan Carlson, whom he hasn't spoken to or seen in over four years. It's all open arms. The two are very happy to see each other and didn't miss a beat in their friendship. It's very easy for them to have a conversation and quote-unquote pick up where they left off. This is Cobain's old heroin running crew. Both Lanigan and Carlson are still on heroin. Kurt assumes Dylan is still on the drug, but he believes that Lanigan isn't. Lanigan keeps it very secret from Kurt, but Dylan knows all about what Mark is up to. They still do it together. You wouldn't be able to tell that Mark is back on the junk by walking into his home. He keeps it very clean and tidy. He also keeps his drug paraphernalia locked away in a box in the closet. The three begin reminiscing about their old days and past memories they have with each other. They talk about relevant and how it is no longer quote-unquote relevant to the masses as it didn't get much radio play anymore. They joke about doing another album, but it's pretty much set in stone that Relevant was a one-off. Mark asks Kurt what's in the bag, and Kurt would explain that he quote-unquote broke into Courtney's house and stole his old tapes back. They all have a laugh, and then Mark states that he's glad Kurt got away from Courtney when he did, and that he would most likely be dead if he had stayed. They listen to some of Kurt's tapes from 1994, completely in awe of what they are hearing. Even Cobain himself, who has trouble remembering any of the events or the music he recorded back during that time. Dylan and Mark would go on to say they believe these tapes Kurt managed to get out of the house could potentially quote-unquote Change the landscape of music as we know it. Much like Nirvana did with Teen Spirit back in 1991. 
Kurt isn't sure what tapes Courtney took, if any, or maybe Eric Erlinson has the tapes. He will never know due to his memory loss, although he does recall there being more tapes than what he was able to collect. As it begins to get later in the evening, Kurt says he's going to stay at a motel. Lanigan offers for Kurt to stay at his place to save the cash, but he's hoping Kurt would say no. He wants to do heroin, and he would prefer to keep that away from Kurt as much as possible. There's been too many close calls with Kurt and heroin back in 1993 and 1994. Oftentimes, Kurt would need to be babysat by both Mark and Dylan. He even nearly died in front of them a handful of times. Mark knows Kurt kicked the heroin and is still struggling with it. All it would take is the mere sight of heroin to really drive his thoughts of addiction. Kurt neglects to stay at Mark's house much to Mark's relief and opts to stay at a motel for the night before flying back to his home the next day. On his way out the door, he gathers his suitcase filled with tapes he hijacked from Courtney's, and he's on his way. As he gets outside, he is chased after by Dylan Carlson, who gives Kurt a new number he can reach him at. Kurt departs Lanigan's home and books a motel for the night. By the morning, in a purely spiteful move, Kurt goes to the Lake Washington home and tries to contact Courtney, to no avail. He then decides it's better for him and Francis to go back to L.A., considering Courtney isn't even at the house. The nanny doesn't agree with this idea, but eventually gives in. Kurt is Francis' father. There really isn't anything she can do. She will just have to deal with Courtney when she comes home. Later that day, Kurt flies back home to L.A. with his daughter. The next day, Courtney gets a hold of Kurt and is completely irate with the fact that Kurt took Francis back to L.A. with him, and also for the fact that he, quote-unquote, invaded my fucking privacy and stole tapes out of the closet. An argument would ensue over the phone, with Kurt stating that Courtney, quote-unquote, didn't give a shit about him or Francis enough to even be at the house. Courtney would explain that some important business meeting came up at the studio, and she had to be there. It is at this time that Kurt learns about Patty Schimmel being removed from Hole. He's pissed off about it. Patty was Kurt's longtime friend, and for Courtney in the band to backstab her like that is parallel with how Courtney treated Kurt years ago, and how she treats everyone she knows for that matter. Courtney demands that Kurt fly back out to Seattle to drop Francis off. He downright refuses and tells Courtney she has to, quote-unquote, come get her yourself. Cobain quickly hangs up the phone and goes back to painting with Francis. At this time, it is thought that Francis has a lot more fun when she's with Kurt than she does when she's with Courtney. Courtney is never at the house. It's always meetings and having weird junky friends around. But with Kurt, Francis gets to finger paint and make music with her father. She gets to tap the drums and strum the guitars. Only time will tell how this co-parenting relationship is going to work. April 10th, 1998. At around 9.30 p.m., Two slightly large men that Kurt has never seen before show up at his doorstep, stating that they are Courtney's bodyguards and that they are there to pick up Frances Bean and take her to Seattle. Cobain downright refuses to hand over his child to these men, stating that not a soul on earth can strong arm him into giving over his child. Kurt states to these men, quote unquote, tell that fucking bitch to get her ass on a plane and come here herself if she wants to see her fucking daughter. He slams the door. The two men seemingly leave, but about two minutes later, a large picture window in Kurt's living room has a giant rock fly through it, completely smashing the window 
and a painting in front of the window where Cobain had painted the cover for Relevant. The police are called, and out of fear of more violent things happening or any more damage to his house being done, the nanny who stays with Kurt agrees to get on a flight to Seattle in the morning. The nanny is the only person Kurt would consider sending his daughter anywhere with. By the end of April, Kurt isn't in a good mindset about the ordeal with Courtney that had happened weeks prior. He didn't like how easy it was for her to send her lackeys or quote-unquote hitmen to his house and smash a window. Kurt calls Dylan Carlson, who picks up the phone. Kurt confided in Dylan when it came to these things, almost like Dylan knew exactly what to do. Dylan Carlson would tell Kurt he should buy a gun to protect his home. He then makes the decision to buy a new shotgun. He feels like he needs to protect his home and his daughter. This ordeal brought back a lot of paranoia and anxious tendencies. Kurt immediately goes to the closest gun store and buys a 20 gauge shotgun, along with three boxes of birdshot shells. The next time anyone shows up on his doorstep uninvited, they will be greeted accordingly. May 1998 Kurt wants to continue working on his ideas for the solo project he conceived. Except now, he has his old tapes. He can't believe he was able to get to the house and get them. It's a shame he had to quote-unquote steal them. But they were his to begin with. He didn't want to have to do it like that. He actually wanted to meet Courtney. He wouldn't have made arrangements to meet if he didn't want to. These tapes were his, they were only really crucial to him, and nobody else. There's some really well thought out, beautiful things on these tapes. Some of which we've heard through Montage of Heck, and more that we haven't. Kurt home acoustic demos that we can only begin to imagine. He starts to sift through the tapes. Instead of using any of these quote-unquote songs... For his solo project, he uses the tapes to gather ideas and to piece together new songs using these old demos. It is around this time in May of 1998 that Pat Smear would contact Kurt Cobain. It's been just over a year since the two last spoke. Pat would explain to Kurt that he's leaving Foo Fighters as the guitar player. There was not any personal reasons against Dave. He just felt like it was time to stop touring and focus on his family, which Kurt admired. There was no love lost between Kurt and Pat. Pat helped Kurt through some of the hardest times of his life. He was there all through rehab, and even had a few writing credits on Rohypnol. The decision to join Foo Fighters full-time and embark on a world tour had nothing to do with Kurt or Nirvana. It's believed that all parties involved needed to go their separate ways and find themselves. Kurt and Pat would arrange a date to meet up and hang out, someday in L.A. On this call, Kurt jokes that he has a date with P.J. Harvey this week. Although it's not a date, P.J. plans to meet with Kurt and discuss a potential project in the future. It is also around this time, by mid-May, one year after Jeff Buckley tragically passed away in that drowning accident, Kurt would assist in producing some of Jeff's unfinished work, which he called, quote-unquote, truly masterful and a step in the right direction. He has also spent a lot of time compiling old Janitor Joe records and reworking some of Kristen Paff's old tracks. But it is believed he wasn't really working on anything. He just wanted to hear Kristen again. Her death really got to him. And was one of the driving forces that steered him away from Seattle and its drug scene. He still hasn't gotten over it. And he doesn't think he ever will. 
May 23rd, 1998. Kurt Cobain and P.J. Harvey finally meet in person. The two have been talking over the phone. P.J. really loved Relevant. She couldn't stop talking about very specific parts of certain songs. This showing Kurt that she actually listened to it and she understood it. She loved the way he mixed the album. How raw but yet somewhat polished it is. She really wanted her next record to sound like that. Kurt couldn't believe it. The way she talked about music and creativity really made him open up. And they sat at the table in the coffee shop for over three hours, just talking. Kurt, for the first time in a long time, sees something in P.J. Harvey. Something he hasn't seen since Kristen Path. Although, P.J. isn't there to be romantic with Kurt. This is more or less a business meeting. It is very clear here that a seed has been planted. June 1998 with the internet now becoming more prominent, fan sites on Kurt Cobain and Nirvana start to surface just as they did in a real timeline. A lot of rumors and speculation emerge on these sites, with a few of these sites claiming to hold possession of brand new Kurt Cobain demos, and these songs begin to circulate around various fan-made websites across the internet. But it is known that Kurt Cobain demos do not exist, and these songs that are circulating are just fakes. By June, the arranged meetings between nannies between LA and Seattle have resumed as usual, although Courtney will neglect to contact Kurt or have any talks with him. On June 6, 1998, PJ Harvey arrives at Kurt Cobain's home outside of LA. Francis Bean is there where Harvey now gets the chance to meet Francis. Kurt sees how good PJ is with Francis, and that makes him extremely happy. Cobain and PJ Harvey would retreat to Cobain's studio and record a song that Harvey had come prepared with. She wanted to see what he could do to give it the sound she's looking for. The two completely hit it off during this meeting, with Harvey now potentially feeling the way Kurt did when he first met her. Like Kurt reminds her of something that she really loves. It's no secret that PJ Harvey is not into drugs. And some of her previous relationships have ended. Due to her partner's addictions. But she knows Kurt hasn't been on heroin since 1994. And he's been to rehab. She feels like he's safe although she has no idea about the downer medications or the alcohol. P.J. Harvey packs up and sets out to leave that night. When leaving the house, she turns back and gives Kurt a subtle wink, and her car arrives, and she's off to the airport. Kurt feels something for her. He hasn't felt this way for anyone in quite some time. By the end of June 1998, Kurt begins noticing people lurking around his home late at night, and on other occasions he notices strange cars parked nearby, within view of his house, who would drive away when he turned the porch light on. He feels like this has something to do with Courtney, and that she will find any way to retaliate against him, if she can. She's just trying to scare him. Kurt schedules an appointment for an electrician to come by and install some more security lights, as well as some home surveillance cameras. He also calls Dylan Carlson, who he asks to spy on Courtney, to see who she's been talking to or sending to his house. Dylan lets Kurt know that he hasn't spoken to Courtney in some time, almost a couple years now, but he can, quote-unquote, do some digging. Ever since the divorce, any of Kurt's friends who hung around Courtney no longer do so, 
as they refuse to be her pawns in whatever game she's playing. July 1998 Recording with P.J. Harvey continues. Kurt lets P.J. Harvey in on what's been going on with Courtney and the strange people around his home lately, basically spilling his guts to her. Harvey accepts all this information calmly and tells Kurt she believes he should do whatever he feels right to protect his home and his child. She even jokes that he should hire Tom Grant, the one who wrote the book about Kurt and Courtney a few years back, after his ordeals with the Cobains in 1994. They both find it hysterical. But right now in Kurt's mind, he starts to question Courtney, and if she's capable of pulling off these scare tactics now, who knows what she may have been up to four years ago. By this time in the summer of 1998, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana are still highly regarded by fans and their peers in the music scene. Kurt Cobain is still seen as a major influence on a lot of new bands that are arriving on the scene. Rivers Cuomo of Weezer would state, If Kurt Cobain and Nirvana didn't exist, neither would we. Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day would say, quote unquote, It's weird when you're influenced by someone from your own generation. But Kurt Cobain made that happen. By this time in 1998, new styles of music have emerged. Namely, new metal in various forms of rap metal, such as Korn, Limp Bizkit, and Kid Rock. And they would have taken over the mainstream by now. Members of Korn would go on to praise Kurt Cobain and Nirvana for opening up the airwaves to harder music, and would also praise Kurt for overdosing multiple times and not dying, saying, quote-unquote, the most badass dude who ever lived. August 1998 Kurt begins writing new songs at home using the demo tapes he stole from the Lake Washington home. These songs are mainly acoustics for the time being. Kurt didn't want to make this solo album entirely about him. He wanted a band, or at least be involved in a number of collaborations that would make up the majority of the album. At first... He even considered calling William Goldsmith, who was a hell of a drummer, who had also just quit Foo Fighters during the recording of their second album back in 1997. Foo Fighters now has Taylor Hawkins on drums, who Kurt knew of and admired. He felt like getting William Goldsmith would be too close to having Dave Grohl on drums and too connected to Foo Fighters. So he went with a more rudimental approach and called Patty Schemmel. Considering she's available now, since being ejected from Courtney's band, Hole. Patty is very happy to hear from Kurt, and it doesn't take long before she agrees to join Kurt's project. Pat Smear would also be contacted, although he agrees to stop by and make some music as long as, quote-unquote, there's no tours involved. Cobain would agree. In late August of 1998, it is reported on MTV and other media outlets that Kurt Cobain and P.J. Harvey are now romantically linked. Neither Cobain nor Harvey would officially confirm this rumor. Although a disguised Cobain and Harvey are spotted holding hands at a Radiohead concert on August 29th, 1998. September 15, 1998. Dylan Carlson calls Kurt with an urgent message. Kurt isn't around to pick up the phone, but Dylan leaves a message. The message states, Kurt, Kurt, pick up. Courtney heard about you and PJ Harvey, and apparently she's on her way to L.A. Fuck, man, pick up. Kurt gets the message later that night and calls back Carlson immediately, who also doesn't answer. 
in the early morning hours of September 16th, 1998, Cobain is on edge. He's been sitting in the dark, watching close by the windows to see if he can spot anyone. The new security camera he had installed is blocked by a tree, and now he has to make yet another appointment to cut the tree down. He sees a dark figure just quietly standing by the end of the driveway, holding something in his hand, pointed at the house. Upon seeing this figure, Kirk goes upstairs to a small window on the top floor just above the driveway. He pulls the shotgun out of its case and loads three shells into it. Kurt then very quietly slides the window up, not to be noticed. He then takes one shot directly at the figure at the end of the driveway, striking him directly in the knee. He then fires again into the driveway in hope to scare this person off. Cobain immediately calls the police after the second shot is fired. With this mysterious person still laying in agony in the driveway, the cops arrive. It is here that Kurt finds out this person was a fan, holding a camera up to try and get a picture of Kurt Cobain's house. Cobain had just shot this person in the leg, and then fired another shot into the ground that could have killed this man, had his aim been slightly off. The police would confiscate the shotgun until an investigation can be conducted. Kurt Cobain at this time is very pissed off and irate. On September 18th, charges are filed against Cobain for shooting this 22-year-old fan who claims he wasn't even on Cobain's property when he was shot and that he didn't have any weapons and had no reason to be shot. Cobain would explain the ongoing issues with Courtney and people stalking his house, but it fell on deaf ears. The court hearing would be set for October 25th, 1998. Kurt calls Dylan, who answers this time, and Cobain would explain that he had just shot a fan who was intruding on his property and that the police took his gun. Dylan thought it was funny and he laughed and explained to Kurt that he would catch a flight and be by in the morning and he, he would help him obtain yet another gun, quote-unquote, just in case. October 1998 PJ Harvey doesn't blame Kurt for what he did to the fan who was intruding on his property. She didn't believe in guns, but ever since Kurt explained the situation between him and Courtney to her, she feared for his safety. It's now official that Kurt and PJ are romantically seeing each other. But in the media, it's simply rumors. Dylan is back and forth on the phone with Kurt, even appearing at his house once or twice to drop off newly purchased firearms for Kurt to, quote-unquote, keep himself safe. It is during these visits and phone calls that Dylan lets Kurt know what he dug up about Courtney. She's pissed off he took the tapes from her closet behind her back and that he basically kidnapped their daughter. Financially, Courtney isn't doing that well. She can no longer afford the Lake Washington home and is planning to put it up for sale. In 1994, the couple paid $1.5 million for the home. Now Courtney wants to sell it for $3 million. Even though no work has been done to it, and it is essentially the exact same as it was when Kurt left. Dylan says he will do as much digging as he can to get Kurt ahead of the curve because Dylan quote-unquote hates Courtney with a passion and will do anything to screw over any type of idiotic plans she has. October 25th. During the court hearing for Cobain and the 22-year-old fan that he had shot, it is decided that the court would rule in Cobain's favor. Considering this fan who was taking pictures of Kurt Cobain's home was actually two feet 
into the driveway, not the sidewalk. So the shooting was warranted due to it taking place on private property. Cobain pays no damages or medical bills for this fan, and his shotgun is returned to him. November 1998 Kurt is still writing new music. A lot of it is soft and acoustic, similar to something you might hear from the likes of Dumb or Polly, or even Burn the Rain. But a part of Kurt feels like he has a lot of pent-up anger he needs to get out, and this soft acoustic music isn't doing it for him. There's still a huge part of Kurt that loved punk rock, and the loud screeching guitars. He doesn't necessarily want to just sit and play depressing acoustic music. He has a lot of creativity still in the tank. On November 11th, 1998, Courtney Love decides to return the favor and not return Francis being back to Cobain's house in L.A. On the same day, another car is spotted parked outside Cobain's house. Making Cobain afraid to leave the house in fears that he might be followed. He also doesn't want to shoot at the car in case he's just another fan. Kurt would attempt to call Courtney, but he doesn't get a hold of her. He leaves a scathing message on the answering machine. He goes on to say that he's done with her childish games. He sat idly by and watched her quote-unquote fuck every man that came her way, and that she has no right to have an opinion on his sex life and that if she contacts P.J. Harvey, or even mentions her, he will have her dealt with. He also goes on to say that these foolish games she's playing with their child isn't going to end well for her, and that he's going to sue her for custody of Francis. And that he will win because he's more financially stable than she is. Kurt hangs up and immediately calls Dylan Carlson, who was hanging out with Mark Lanigan at the time. Mark and Dylan arranged to fly out to Kurt's house in the following days. December 1998 Both of Francis Bean's nannies would refuse to take part in the co-parenting fiasco that is Cobain and Love, and would agree to meet up with each other and work out a way that both parents can still see Francis without there being any issues. At this time, Cobain's lawyer would officially serve love papers in a child custody battle, which will take place in 1999. Kurt didn't want this. He tried to remain civil with Courtney, but quickly realized how much of an evil witch she can really be. Nothing changed with her. Nothing will ever change with her. Kurt feels like an idiot thinking it could have ever worked. But for the sake of Francis Bean, Kurt feels he should take full responsibility for her as he is more financially stable and more quote-unquote together in the head than Courtney is. Mark and Dylan would hang out at Kurt's house just to keep him company over the holidays. They would record some songs together, with Mark and Dylan providing creative advice on some of Kurt's partial song ideas. At this time, Mark Lanigan sneaks away to do heroin in Kurt's bathroom. The issue here is that after cleaning up and making it look like he wasn't doing any heroin, he failed to notice a cap from one of the syringes sitting on the back of the toilet. He would leave the bathroom without noticing. Mark would return from the bathroom, and Kurt would say, quote-unquote, What the fuck did you eat, man? You were gone for 30 minutes. Francis Bean spends Christmas Day this year with Wendy O'Connor, Kurt's mother. Throughout the end of 1998, Cobain is still manifesting song ideas for a potential solo album concept that he has conceived. He's now dating PJ Harvey, although they keep their relationship out of the public eye. And things are starting to pick up with Courtney Love, but not for the better. 1999 will truly prove to be a hard year for the Cobain estate as a whole.
Where does this leave us now? Five years after Kurt Cobain's potential death in 1994. This will conclude if Kurt Cobain lived 1998. We hope you enjoyed listening and please stay tuned for If Kurt Cobain Lived 1999. Please like this video and comment below. The continued support of this channel keeps this series alive. And I appreciate all the feedback. I will see you in the comment section.